The investigation into the Boston Massacre begins here on Boston Common. To separate truth from propaganda, we asked actors to reenact the events based on eyewitness statements. We need this much space to make this line. Reenactments of eyewitness accounts may show us if the events were physically possible. When you come in as a mob, you're going to actually be close. We hope to discover where different sense of testimony agree and where they diverge. These bayonets are going to be down live steel. You cannot let your attention drift from the bayonets. The forensic team can focus on the places where the witness statements differ. The shooting involved eight British enlisted men and one officer. The actors portraying the soldiers have reproduced as accurately as possible the uniforms and weapons of the period, including this brown vest musket. As night falls, the actors gather in front of the old state house. The busy city street has been blocked for the reenactment of the Boston Massacre, where it occurred long ago. Turn the right to Bob. Hey. The weather on the night of the reenactment is moderate, but on March 5, 1770, the temperature was unusually cold, well below freezing, with a blanket of icy snow covering the ground. That evening, a British sentry, Private Hugh White, was guarding the customs house located here. Around 8 p.m., a young apprentice, Edward Garrick, began to taunt White. The taunting continued until White struck Garrick with the butt of his musket. Garrick fell to the ground. Word of the incident swept through the town. A swarm of angry citizens descended on the square. Many of them had been drinking in the local taverns. The crowd surrounded the sentry and threatened him with bodily harm. Call out the main guard! While the entire town appeared to be erupting, Captain Thomas Preston was in the main barracks across the street from the old state house, close enough to hear sentry White call for help. Captain Preston marched in with six privates and a corporal. The British rescue team reached White and attempted to escort him back to the barracks, but they were stopped by a mob of up to 300 angry citizens. Hemmed in by the crowd, Preston ordered his troops into a semicircle formation and took a position in front of his men. Several people in the crowd dared the soldiers to shoot, yelling fire over and over. It made the, the British soldiers feel like they didn't have any courage. You know, they're wanting the fire, they're wanting to answer that call, but they can't. And the crowd knows they can't, so they're daring them. The demonstration turned lethal when Patriot Richard Palms struck a soldier, Private Hugh Montgomery, with a stick. Montgomery fell to the ground then rose up and fired. The Boston Massacre began moments later. The other soldiers let loose a fusillade of musket fire. Eleven colonials fell. Once they had fired, the mob retreated. So the soldiers reloaded their weapons, and as the mob had come back in to retrieve their wounded, the soldiers thought that the mob was advancing on them to do them harm. They leveled their muskets at the crowd as if to fire again. When Preston saw this, he immediately knocked up their muzzles, yelling, don't fire, stop, don't fire. Preston ordered the men into a column of twos and then marched them back to the main guard. Paul Revere, Samuel Adams, and other Patriot leaders quickly claimed that the violent confrontation had been a massacre, a symbol of British tyranny, and they demanded justice. Captain Preston claimed that the shootings had been a tragic accident, but to no avail. 
On March 13th, Preston and six of the eight enlisted men were indicted for murder. The lawyer defending the British soldiers was John Adams, the same man who would become America's second president. The trial hinged on this question. Had the British soldiers acted in self-defense or did they commit murder? <laughs> 